I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And let's begin here. I mean, this trial was so intense. Um, I don't know how the parties were able to do anything afterwards, including Alec Murdoch and everyone involved. It's just the intensity of this thing, especially inside that courtroom when you were down there. Um, with that being said, this is a, a, a trial the nation watched, and people had very strong opinions about the case. Very strong about the evidence, about the arguments, about the people involved. Once, once people are connected to a trial in a case like this, they are all in. And that's what happened here. We've seen it before in other cases here. Most recently, Johnny Depp, Amber Heard. Uh, we saw the way people were very, very outspoken about how, the way they saw that case, the way they saw that evidence. And in this case, because this is a criminal case, not a civil case like Johnny Depp, Amber Heard, there's a, a couple things that just got to clear up a little bit tonight. Because there's a, a very small faction of the public, but they are misreading what we just experienced. And it's about everyone's role in this case. And let me start with, with the defense. Dick Harputlian, Jim Griffin, the defense attorneys here, they did their jobs. They did their jobs. This, this is their job. And their job is to represent the interests of a man who's been accused of murder. And, and to make sure that he is not wrongfully convicted and that the prosecution in the case um, puts the evidence in and, and, and proves the case. Their job is to attack that case, attack the witnesses, cross-examine them, question uh, the theory of the case, and to make arguments. Now, more than most I, I, people I don't, I mean, I, I a lot of times take issue with some of the arguments that defense attorneys make, but it's about their arguments. It's not personal. It's not a personal attack on what, who they are, what they're doing. Because I understand, and most of you understand, but I get that small faction doesn't understand how important it is that we have criminal defense attorneys that do what Jim Griffin and Dick Harputlian did in this case, and defense attorneys do in all the cases and trials that we cover here on Court TV, and that are taking place in courtrooms from coast to coast. It's important. It's, it's, prosecutors have their role. Their role is to seek the truth, and, and that's, that's their single mission. It's not to win the case. If the truth isn't that the person accused did it, no, you're not doing your job as a prosecutor if you're, accused, if you're uh, uh, convicting an innocent person who you know is innocent, or if you're hiding evidence. Those people should not be prosecutors. They shouldn't be lawyers. But their job is to, is to seek the truth inside a courtroom and get the truth in front of the jury and make all the arguments that support that and put the witnesses on that support that. The defense, it, it's not about that. It's about representing someone who's been accused. Much different roles. But it's their job, and they did their job, and that's how our system works. It's the greatest system in the world. If we don't have defense attorneys fighting, literally fighting for their clients, the system falls apart. It absolutely falls apart. You don't want a cakewalk for prosecutors. That's how innocent people get convicted, how people get wrongfully accused. There's an imbalance. No, we can't have that. Our system works. It worked in this case. 12 people from the community from Alec Murdoch's community, judged him, judged his, his testimony, and took a look at all the evidence. But again, not everyone saw it that way. This small faction conflates a, a family annihilating double murderer with the attorneys who represent him. They're not the same. They're not the same. One is a sociopathic, cold-blooded killer. The other two are professionals who represent people who are accused, who keep our system afloat so it works day in and day out. So let me get to that small faction again because we had an opportunity to speak with Jim Griffin. Dick Harputlian spoke publicly as well about this, about some of the reaction that they have gotten 
in this trial, in this very public trial, this very public story. Take a listen. I had about 30 voicemails this morning, and 25 were words of encouragement. Five were wishing me immediate death and harm. People feel compelled to express their opinion on things through the internet. Somehow they got a hold of my, I guess it's on my website, my email. I really wanted that big case you had, but that's not what they chose to send me. Um, most of it was very positive. But the folks that sent me the, you are a rotten piece of scum, and I hope you die of, let me clean this up a little bit, rectal cancer. Um, you know, what, they have a misapprehension of the system. They have a misapprehension of our justice system. While they're very familiar with the Second Amendment, they're not, they apparently haven't read the Fourth, the Fifth, the Sixth, or the Eighth Amendments that guarantee us the freedom, the freedom, or guarantee our freedoms of ourselves and our property. So, I, you know, I'm agreeing with Dick Harpootlin, right? I didn't agree with him during the trial. I didn't buy his arguments. I didn't buy the case that he was presenting in court. But at the end of the day, he's needed for the system to work. And again, the system does work. Let me bring in my guest joining me tonight in Columbia, South Carolina, attorney, host of the Cup of Justice podcast, Eric Bland is with us. And in Charlotte, North Carolina, host of the Murdoch Family Murders Impact of Influence podcast, Matt Harris. Great to see both of you. Um, Eric, you know, it, it, this it was such an intense case, um, such strong opinions everyone had, and there's this small faction that I guess confuses and conflates and doesn't understand how our system works. I mean, lawyers battle it out in the courtroom, and, you know, sometimes you don't like your adversary, but at the end of the day, we understand everyone's role and how necessary it is for the whole thing to work. Yeah. This is an Iran, you know, we don't charge somebody yesterday and we try them today. We have an amazing, fair, um, equal opportunity justice system for e equal justice for all. Um, I understand that the emotions are raw right now by Dick and Jim, and I fully appreciate that. And, you know, sometimes when you lose a very high profile case, and this was the, one of the most highest profile of all time, you have a tendency to let those emotions show. Look, I got on a lot of TV shows, 178 different television appearances in the last six weeks. And I can tell you, Vinny, I have gotten some pretty, pretty salty uh, Twitter responses. You know, like Jim says, 95% are good. Um, Two or three are pretty personal, uh, attacking my knowledge, attacking my, you know, demeanor, attacking my Philly accent, attacking me personally. Some said, you know, tell us how much you made on the Satterfield case. You know, you're in it for the money. Look, it's, it's part of the game when you're in this high profile type of litigation. And, you know, Dick and Jim stuck it out there pretty hard in the post-verdict uh, and sentencing press conference. They didn't come out there and say, look, we respect the jury's decision. This was a hard fought case. They attacked immediately and said, this thing is gonna be appealed. The clients believe he's more innocent than ever. The jury got it wrong. This was an unfair trial. We uh, you know, were forced to put Alex on because of the improper 404B evidence. And then Dick Carpootlian said, Yes, it's true. He stole from crippled children. He used the word crippled in his press conference and then turned to Jim and Jim said, no, I don't think you should say it. And he said it again and said, I'm just old school. You know, this is what happens in a, in a high profile case. There's winners and losers. And I'm not seeing them losing with grace right now. I got to tell you, I'm not seeing them losing with grace. They're attacking the jury. They're attacking the judge and they're attacking the prosecution by being heavy handed. And they gave as good as they got. You know, unfortunately in this business that we're in, somebody wins and somebody loses. And Dick has won a lot of times in his life. I mean, a lot, but he lost this one. And I think he lost it on the playing field. 
Matt, how do you see the, the sort of the fallout and reaction to um, specifically like Dick Harputley and Jim Griffin as, you know, all of this is, is coming out and the public's beginning to react? Well, Eric, of course, I love it when you talk about going to the wall wall and getting some water. We can relate to that <laughs> with the Philly accent thing. But I uh, will tell you, obviously, and I think he would agree, the reaction is way over the top. Uh, yes, I'll never justify Dick's use of that word. Uh, I kind of disagree with Eric on saying that they should just roll over and say, well, we lost. I mean, you do have appeals and you stick by it, especially if you believe the guy's innocent, right? You stick by that and say, we're going to fight this. And and that's a fair thing to say as someone's attorney. And uh, this has started long ago, the attacks on uh, Dick and Jim, long before using that word, uh, the podcast and whatnot, just attacking the fact that they were defending Alec Murdoch. If you want to talk about his politics or whatever, it's fine, but using his name to make jokes about the fact that he's defending someone is is just lazy, to be quite honest. Uh, they were doing one of the most important jobs, and your opening, Vinny, was brilliant as always. Go back to John Adams defending the, the redcoats that, that killed people in the square, and he defended them. Defense attorneys are important. And if you want to uh, attack them for defending Alec Murdoch, that is just ridiculous. If you want to attack them for their politics or maybe a word they said, that's one thing. But, uh, you know, these guys, I believe, believe that Alec didn't do it. And they want to fight to get their friend and client uh, a just outcome. And, and, just because, and, and it may have been a just outcome. But we've seen in the past that sometimes you dig deep and things are overturned. Now, you, you mentioned, th this is another interesting thing we got from the um, post statements by Dick Harputlian and Jim Griffin here, talking about um, Alec Murdoch and whether or not they believe he's innocent or not. Uh, uh, Jim Griffin spoke to us. Let's again listen to both of them on this issue. It's, it's, fa it's a fascinating um, slight difference in their approach to all this. I wouldn't have defended Alex if I believed for one minute he killed Paul. I can tell you that much. I would not have done that. And so, um, that's what I believed then. That's what I believe now. You don't have to convince me you're innocent for me to represent you. That's not the issue. The issue is, can the state prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? All right, what do you think about that distinction, Eric? Uh, on the one hand, Jim Griffin is saying, listen, I wouldn't have defended him if I didn't think he was innocent. Dick Harputlian, like, it doesn't matter if you're innocent. You don't have to convince me. It's can they prove it? And it's, it's interesting in, in perhaps um, their view of, of Alec Murdoch. Well, I definitely think that Dick um, has a different philosophy and I kind of align myself with him. A defense attorney should never ask his client if he's innocent. He should look at the process and make sure that the charges... But not even, not even asking, yeah. Eric. It's not even taking the... Jim saying I wouldn't have taken the case if I thought he did it. I yeah, wouldn't take the I, case. I, yeah, well, that's letting your own personal beliefs start to affect representation. Dick is, is looking at it more theoretical, saying, I want to make sure that the government brings charges properly. I want to make sure that they get warrants properly. I want to make sure that they're not overcharging them and that they proceed in accordance with the Constitution. And I certainly respect that. There's there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, there there is a fracture that is taking place. You saw Randolph, Randolph uh, Murdoch in his article that was printed in the New York Times. He seems to be separating himself from the family not so much him saying, look, you know, there's unanswered questions, and I definitely think Alex knows some things that he's not uh, revealing. But I think what was more telling is what he said, which happened after the murders, when he said he spent three weeks, as well as a lot of other people, in his firm and in Alex's orbit, making a ton of phone calls, trying to figure out what happened. And Alex showed no interest in what they were doing, didn't make any phone calls himself, and didn't seem to want to find out if there was 
another killer for Maggie and Paul. And that has seemed to trouble Randolph ever since. And that may be why he didn't attend most of the trial, maybe why he didn't attend it. So, look, I didn't, Matt, you got me wrong. I didn't say they should come out and, and apologize and say, no, we're not going to appeal. I, that's not what I was saying at all. But they came out striding. And there were things that they could have conceded uh, about Alex lying, lying to law enforcement and lying to his family and lying to his partners and causing uh, an extraordinary amount of money to be spent to prove the lie at the kennels. So at, Dick could have said, look, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with some of the lies and some of the behavior of my client. But they doubled down and said, we believe today he's more innocent than he was yesterday, and that's a day after a jury verdict. Sometimes maybe the best words you say are the words you don't say. Yeah, at the end of the day, though, they're I, I, they're the ones picking up the appeal, right? They're going to be doing the 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 appeal, is my understanding, that, right? Well, they're, you know, criminal yeah. defense a criminal defense lawyer signs a fee agreement, and it does not provide in that fee agreement. I know that I automatically appeal. Right, it's a separate agreement, but they have to file their notice of appeal in ten days. And if I'm Alex Murdoch, somebody may say to him, maybe you should get a fresh set of eyes. Maybe Jim Griffin is a little too close because he's very friendly with the family. That's why Jim was such a great advocate, because he believed it in his heart. But sometimes that could cloud your objectivity. And maybe, you know, we'll see down the road. Look, they're going to have a hearing quickly to schedule the Satterfield trial. I know that's coming. And, you know, maybe Dick bows out. Maybe Jim bows out. Maybe Alex decides... I need to bring somebody else on the team. Look, Russell he should Lafitte represent himself. He's a lawyer. Represent himself. That would be amazing. <laughs> uh, you got a fool as a client. Yeah. Let's listen to this. I want you to listen to uh, Jim Griffin here talking about Alex's uh, reaction to the verdict. What was Alex's reaction to the verdict? Well, when it came back so quickly, you know, we had prepared him. If a quick verdict is usually bad for the defense. And so he was um, uh, prepared for the result after we had been notified of the verdict. Um, he was uh, disappointed, but he wasn't totally surprised. I mean, going into it, he questioned whether he could get a fair trial in this climate. And we questioned whether he could as well, but you know, we didn't really have much of a choice. I mean, we were dealing with the climate as it was. And, you know, I mean, he expressed to me that, you know, he had gotten his hopes up that he could get a fair trial. But at the end of the day, you know, for a lot of reasons, um, we don't believe, you know, he got a fair trial. All right. Guests are staying with us the whole hour. Wrong. What's that? That's flat out wrong, Vinny. That's just flat out wrong. He got the fairest of trials. That was by his peers, where he lives, where his family lives. Where were you going to put this that anybody in the world doesn't know who Alex Murdoch is. He got that in his own backyard. Yeah, I agree. I, and after listening to the jurors, I agree. Matt, we just got to take a break. You're, gonna, yeah, you're okay. going first. Listen, Eric, Matt goes first next segment, okay? <laughs> I love he. <you. laughs> All right. Uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to hear about Alex Tears, what his defense is saying about that, and the clothes and what the jurors are saying about it as well. In Hillsborough County, Florida, former ice cream man Michael Keatley was the victim of a robbery and a shooting that went unsolved. Prosecutors say the ice cream man did his own investigation and attempted to hand down his own form of justice by shooting six men, killing two of them. But none of the victims of his shooting were actually involved in the robbery. Now, he's on trial for murder. Did you tell, just as those instructions say, did you tell Detective Lugo how certain you were that that was the person that you shot, that identification? Yes, I told him I was 2,000% sure that he was the guy that shot me. This is a case of revenge. An ice cream man is mugged, beaten, and robbed. 
Now he stands accused of murder. He became obsessed with finding who shot him. Was this a vigilante double homicide, or is it a case of mistaken identity? The Ice Cream Man Murder Retrial. Coverage continues weekdays at 8, 7 central on Court. Brand for sensitive skin. So is Alec prepared to spend the rest of his life behind bars? You know, no one wants to think about that. He is, he's prepared to spend a significant amount of time in prison, and he always, um, since September 2021, I mean, he, he came to, to that realization after he found himself alive and not dead from after he received a shot in the head. And, uh, you know, he's, he, he has resigned himself to prison as his life for a while. Now, is it, is it his life till the end of his life? You know, I don't think anyone can think like that. But it's going to be. I mean, two consecutive life sentences, plus all the other charges that have, are piled up. It's not going anywhere. Okay, the tears, the emotions of uh, Alec Murdoch inside the courtroom, a big, big issue. Chanley asked Jim Griffin about that and also about... Um, you know, the jurors, what they're saying about it. So you'll hear from Jim Griffin, then you'll hear from one of the jurors that we spoke to last night. They obviously didn't believe him at the end of the day, but they wouldn't have believed him, you know, based on what they'd already heard. Now, I was a little taken aback by some of the jurors saying that, that he had crocodile tears up there, which is, I mean, if, I mean, I've been living with a guy for months, and I mean, he cries constantly. And if you saw him during the trial, he was over there crying every time there were crime scene photos. And for that, you know, from some jurors to say he wasn't crying on the witness stand, I mean, that, I mean, that, that just gives me concern. I think that from prior witnesses, we already knew that he was able to be very convincing. He was able to be very convincing in court. He's able to go up there on the witness stand and he knows that he's having to, um, He's having to relate to a jury. He's wanting to show those emotions, and we already know that he's able to do that. Um, so I think that a lot of the jurors were able to see through that. Let's bring back in our guests, Eric Glenn, Matt Harris with us. Uh, Matt, these um, emotions of Alec Murdoch, jury obviously did not buy him. Uh, many of the jurors who have spoken afterwards talking about, you know, I didn't see tears. Yeah. Um, well, one thing, let me be very clear that we've been talking about for the last half hour, whatever it is, the things that I'm saying don't make me say that Alec did not commit the murders or he's not a scumbag. He is. It's just about how the defense is handling it, how the jurors are talking and that sort of thing. And I think when Jim was saying uh, earlier that, uh, you know, he was going to, he thought he didn't get a fair trial. I don't think he's referring to that there was jury issues or, or whatnot. I, I am assuming he's referring to what they're gonna go on appeal and you guys are the bright attorneys, uh, just thinking out loud as a dumb podcast guy, that they're gonna go after the fact that all his prior bad deeds were let in and, and it wasn't to motive. That's, I'm assuming that's what he's gonna argue. So he's gonna have to stick with that when he's giving interviews, which is yeah. the fact that, you know, right there, they're like, we don't buy it because we heard all these times about how Alex lied to all these people. He never seemed to be truthful. He never seemed to be uh, a, a person who was upfront. He couldn't even remember when he lied to people. And that is all true. I think what, I, I shouldn't speak for Jim, what I think he's saying is, once you got all that bad act stuff in, once you got all that past behavior in, this jury was not gonna believe any emotion that Alec portrayed or genuinely felt and you know I've talked to you Vinny about this from the very beginning I think it's a uh, you know if you see him crying and you're pro Alec you're like oh the poor guy and if you're anti Alec you're like he's faking it. it it's just a you just believe what you want to believe I don't know I don't know the answer but I think that's what Griffin is saying that he, this hole was dug so deep that there's nothing Alec could do that would have had them to believe any emotion was real want to play uh, Jim Griffin again here, uh, and that juror that we spoke to last night, talking about the clothes and how they could have played a very significant role for the defense. Take a listen. Everyone wants to know, 
Where are the clothes that he wore to work that day? I have no idea. I have no idea. They were clean, and he was, he was in five places. And he was picked up on the side of the road. Well, he was shot on the side of the road, airlifted. And his car, you can see pictures of his car. He's got clothes hanging in the back of his car. And there's a blue shirt hanging back there that Sled probably has. I don't know where, where they are. I mean, he's got his khakis were accounted for. Well, we know that two months later, August 11th, uh, law enforcement was able to recover a video where he's wearing slacks and a blue button down. I believe that those were most likely the clothes that were used that night. Um, I would imagine that they're probably, they were probably taken off with the guns at the same time. Um, and then, you know, at some point in time throughout the night, he changes into those shorts and that t-shirt um, whenever law enforcement gets there and that's what they see them in. Unless they were able to just find the guns and find those clothes and just have everything, exact, you know, squeaky clean that, you know, to where we knew that they weren't there and they weren't used and that Alex wasn't there. You know, you'd have, to, well, the thing is that there's evidence that he is there. So that's a really tough question. You know, I'm not sure if there is a piece of evidence that, you know, would give me reasonable doubt. Um, I had to make my decision without a reasonable doubt, and I did. Eric, he, he was wavering a little bit with me when I was asking, well, what if, you know, was there any piece of evidence that could have changed your mind from the defense? There really wasn't anything, um, except he sort of said if they brought in the clothes that he was wearing and they were clean, you know, that would have made him think a little bit more about. But those clothes were nowhere to be found, were they, Eric? No, and, uh, you know, again... I, I am a big proponent of Jim Griffin, have my differences with Dick Carpootlian. But you just heard Jim there attack Sled again by saying, well, there was a blue shirt in the car, so Sled may have the shirt, and somehow they're hiding the shirt. It, again, this, this repeated attacking of Sled, um, I don't think is the best um, method to attack what happened in that courtroom. I, I just think that it's it's gone a little too far. The judge told them in the sentencing, I didn't like the way that you waylaid on SLED for six straight weeks. And to insinuate that SLED has the shirt because it was in a car three months later, but Jim's uh, avoiding the fact that Bianca testified, Blanca, that Alex came to her and said, I was wearing a Vinnie Vine shirt. I wasn't wearing a Columbia fishing shirt, right? We we know that, right? So it, I just think that they're they're stepping on the throat of the government a little too hard. That's all that's just my opinion. I have another opinion and that is Matt's got one of the best pompadour haircuts I've ever seen. <laughs> no, it's and you good. haven't said a word about it, Vinny. You no, haven't said a looks, word about it. Uh, uh, it looks really good. That's a great observation. It's my new do, man. 